Thank you all for coming today. I'm Paige Wright, Senior Library Technician at Cultural Collections. Uh, welcome to the exhibition launch of Captured at UON. Captured is a new exhibition from State Archives and Records New South Wales that explores the stories of men, women, and children incarcerated in New South Wales jails. This traveling exhibition will be displayed downstairs until 13th of April. Today, we will be hearing from Mark Killian and Dr. Penny Stanner from the State Archives and Records Authority of New South Wales. They have both done a tremendous amount of work on this exhibition, and I'm delighted to have them here to discuss it. After Dr. Stanner's talk, we will head downstairs to Cultural Collections and have afternoon tea, and you will get a chance to ask further questions and to view the exhibition. Without further ado, here is Mark Killian, Manager, Public Access at the State Archives and Records, New South Wales. Thanks very much, Paige. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I would normally start a talk by saying I'm very pleased to be here, and let me tell you, I'm very pleased to be here, um, <laughs> given that we've only just made it, um, but very happy to, to be here in Newcastle this afternoon. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay respect to Elders past and present and to any Aboriginal people here today. What we thought we'd do this afternoon is provide you with a bit of an introduction to the New South Wales State Archives. It's possibly an institution that you <coughs> may have heard of before or may not have, but uh, I think a, a, an introduction to us as an organisation and the State Archives collection uh, will then feed nicely into when I then hand over to Penny to talk about the captured exhibition specifically. Um, so I dare say that uh, for many of you, uh, if you've heard of New South Wales State Archives, your eyes may well glaze over uh, completely with that expression. I know it certainly... No, no, I, I reject that proposition. Excellent. <laughs> These are history students. Excellent. Uh, it certainly happens with me on a Saturday night. The minute you say that you're a keeper of government records, trust me, it clears the room. It clears the room. You are left in the kitchen by yourself, I can assure you. But that's essentially what we do at the New South Wales State Archives. We care for records of New South Wales government agencies that are no longer required by those government agencies, but which nevertheless need to be kept in perpetuity for some reason or other, whether that's uh, for historical, uh, its historical value, its legal value, its administrative value, or perhaps its financial value. And of course, it's only a proportion of all those records that uh, are created by government agencies that are kept as state archives. Anyone want to hazard a guess as a percentage of what sort of percentage of records are kept as state archives? I'll give you a clue, it's between one and a hundred. <laughs> Anyone else? 20%. 20%? Do I have any? Yep. 5%. Right on the money. It's actually about 5% of all the records created by government agencies that are kept as state archives because they need to be kept because of their enduring value. That doesn't sound like a lot, but when you consider that at the moment that 5% of records that has been kept since the start of European settlement currently, if you put it end on end, would stretch 81 kilometres. So it's a vast collection of material that we hold, and it's material that dates from the start of European settlement, actually about 1787, uh, and because uh, we do have documented evidence of some uh, uh, events that occurred prior to the arrival of the First Fleet uh, in January 1788. Amongst that 81 kilometres are gems of records uh, that can assist any form of historical research that you're doing uh, and can assist research right across a, a broad scope of research, not even just within the history field, but a wide variety, architecture, um, administrative histories around government agencies, the history of corrective services, the history of um, engineering, whatever it might be, the State Archives can assist in that way because of that 81 kilometres which is known as the State Archives Collection. What I wanted to do was just show you a few gems, if you like, of the State Archives Collection to give you a bit of a feel for the sort of material that we have, but I can assure you that we could be here uh, all afternoon 
with me just showing you examples of the wonderful material that's in the State Archives collection. So just a few things. First of all, convict records. And what you have in front of you is what's known as a ticket of leave. And a ticket of leave was like a form of probation for convicts who were transported out here, primarily from the UK. If well behaved, after a certain number of years had elapsed, a convict was entitled to this uh, document, a ticket of leave. And it allowed them to have certain privileges. It allowed them to work for themselves. It allowed them to sleep outside of barracks. And it gave them those freedoms. In, re in return, they had to report regularly to police. They had to stay within the area that was specified in their ticket of leave. And if at all possible, they had to go to church every Sunday. Now, what we have as part of the State Archives Collection are what we call the, the ticket of leave butts. And this is the ticket of leave but for a man by the name of John Fitch or John Natchbull, um, using an alias there. The reason we call these ticket of leave butts is because that's exactly what they are. The actual full document was about twice the size of what you see in front of you. But the edge of the, the full document was perforated so that when a convict got a ticket of leave, the idea would be the officials would rip out the half of the document that was then given to the convict, so that if they were pulled up at any stage and challenged, they could say, well, here's my ticket of leave, I'm allowed to be travelling here, there or everywhere. And then the government officials would keep the butt of that ticket of leave book so that they could prove when a document was handed in or if a convict was trying to perhaps act under false pretenses, they could prove whether a document was a forgery or not. And one of the ways they did that was to put a florid design down the middle of that whole document along that perforated edge. And you can see the government's half of that flurry design on this side of the document. So it was an easy way of being able to verify whether a document was a forgery or not by matching up the left-hand side of the document that was handed in with the right-hand side of the butt that had been kept by the government officials. So that's the ticket of leave material, but uh, it's only a small proportion of all of the convict records that we hold of convicts transported to New South Wales. Uh, uh, so you do know who I am, why I'm being such a, a noisy person. I just wanted to, to draw the students' attention to the information there that would identify the person. So we're talking about photographs okay. in the exhibition. Are you going to talk about this? I don't okay. mean to preempt you. Um, but that they, they kept records of what convicts looked like and what distinguishing marks they might have. And so we have, in terms of finding John Fitch again, his height, his complexion, ruddy, so florid, a bit, coloured, um, sorry, you know, red, uh, hair dark brown and eyes blue. And, and if there were scars, if there were uh, tattoos and other sets of convict records, they included those as well. And so this is really the precursor to the photographs that yes, we were talking about absolutely. later on and looking at. And really is, a, um, if you like, a, an outward sign of the preoccupation of the government certainly in that first half of the 19th century when there was a bulk of the convict population. So they had to keep track of them. They had to know where they were and they had to know that they were who they said they were at different times and through a physical description um, they were able to do that. I think one of the gems of the State Archives collection is uh, one of my favourites which is the Colonial Secretary's correspondence. So the Colonial Secretary was, as the name suggests, Secretary to the Colony. So it meant that anyone who was in the colony who wanted something from the government, or if the government wanted to convey to the population of New South Wales some sort of uh, new regulation or new change of policy or some sort of indulgence that was given to an individual or group of people, it was often done through the colonial secretary. You can imagine that as the, the colony grew, the colonial secretary's job was a huge one uh, because it was managing the correspondence both incoming to the government and outgoing uh, from the government. It was also a job that, of course, pre-existed um, a whole lot of other government departments being set up. So this colonial secretary in the colonial secretary's department was seen as the second most powerful and second most influential government official in the colony in the early days, with the only one uh, more influential and more powerful being the governor of New South Wales. But the colonial secretary could make decisions and was petitioned about a whole range of matters. Whether someone wanted a grant of land, whether a convict wanted one of those tickets of leave, 
whether there were people who wanted to admit people into mental asylums, or someone wanting to plead their case if they were in jail, or if they were orphans and were picked up off the streets of Sydney and needed to be cared for in one of the, the asylums, then it was all for all of these cases and so many more, it was the colonial secretary that, who was written to uh, asking for government assistance in some way. And as you might be able to see from this letter, when someone wrote to the government asking for something, they had to make good their case. So it wasn't just a case of, um, my name's James McAnulty, I'd like a ticket of leave. They had to state their case. And this is particularly the case when they're asking for land in particular. They couldn't just write and say, my name's John Smith, I'd like 30 acres of land in Bathurst. They would have to say, my name's James Smith, I'm 39 years of age, I've got three grown sons that would help me till the land. I arrived as a convict 20 years ago, that I've been well behaved, I've been pardoned, I've had a ticket of leave. Um, and now I want to develop this land as, a, as an agricultural uh, plot, whatever it might be. So you then get to see the huge value of a lot of this material because it's actually putting the colour into our history so much because it's showing what someone had been doing since they arrived in the colony, what sort of um, activity they'd been doing, but also their status. Had they been immigrants? Had they been convicts? Had they been previously military men? And so on. Just a few more examples of the sort of material that we hold. Um, this is the front page of what's known as a deceased estate file. And a deceased estate file is basically a financial record. It was created by the old stamp duties office, the government department known as the stamp duties office, now the office of state revenue. Uh, and it, these records were created at a time when death duties were payable. When someone died, their estate was valued and tax was then payable on that estate. And death duties were payable in New South Wales from the late 19th century right through up until the 1980s. And for each estate that went through, that had to have this tax paid on it, uh, there was a file created. And these files are known as the deceased estate files. Now we have, as part of the State Archives collection, nine and a half thousand boxes of these files tens of thousands of these files, all dealing with an individual's estate. So typically, a file will comprise this front page, and this is the front page of Banjo Patterson's um, file, famous Australian um, author and poet, um, and the front page just of his file. Underneath that file typically will be a list of every, someone's real estate, so the land they own, the house they own, the personal estate they had, the personal jewellery they had, all of the material goods that they had that was worth some money is enumerated and laid out um, chapter and verse in these deceased estate files. So these are one of the most popular series of records that we have as part of the State Archives collection. Bearing in mind that the vast majority of people who come to use us are people doing their family history. So if you find a deceased estate file for your ancestor, then it's a case of you really know exactly what they had when they died. And I'm talking down to the cutlery they had in their house, the crockery they had in their house, the clocks they had in their house, the rugs that they had in their house. It's all enumerated in these deceased estate files. And then a final value of the estate um, is then uh, calculated on the basis of that enumeration of all of their belongings. So in the case of Banjo Patterson, it tells us that his estate was worth around £255 when he died. Another really popular series of records that we hold are what we call the probate packets. And these aren't dissimilar to those deceased estate files. When someone dies, there has to be a, a process called probate that happens, which is basically the administration of that person's <coughs> estate making sure that the executor is who they say they are of an estate, that the money goes to, that there's enough money to go to the people who uh, are left uh, money or uh, things in a will, and how that will is then distributed and those funds and those, that property is distributed. So for every person whose estate goes through probate, there's what's called a probate packet um, produced and developed. And again, these probate packets form part of the State Archives collection and form thousands of boxes, more than the deceased estate files of being 9,500 boxes. And they basically are a packet of documents. 
every probate packet will include a copy of, of will include the original will that someone made. So the actual signature of someone, you know, possibly on their deathbed, writing out their last will and testament, who they wanted their money to go to, who they wanted their land to go to, whatever it might be. But in amongst all that, the other documents that you'll find in probate packets are all things like statements of death. When someone last saw the person alive, maybe a statement from the, the doctor who last per saw the person alive to say, you know, when I last saw them, it was clear they were going to die within the next 48 hours or whatever it might be. And also, in the case of the famous aviator Sir Charles Kingsford Smith, circumstances around his death and circumstances around his uh, remains and uh, the remains of his aeroplane trying to be found. So that in the case of him, um, it tells us all of the sorts of efforts they made to try and find um, his plane. And his probate packet also includes copies of leaflets that were airdropped on various countries throughout the South Pacific and throughout Southeast Asia, written in those languages to try and alert the people of Thailand, Rangoon, or wherever it might be, to the fact that this plane had gone down, that they were trying to recover the, the body of the pilot. So the probate packet contains those leaflets in about 10 or 11 different languages, all saying the same thing, that the government was trying to find uh, the, the remains of the, the aircraft that went down. So you can see a copy of pamphlet that down the bottom of that uh, pull-out window there, a copy of a pamphlet printed in five languages and widely distributed throughout the Malay Peninsula and Siam is attached. Yes? Did they actually find him? No. Really? That's sad. No, he hasn't been found. Um, it's kind of one of those mysteries of, of life, really. Um, another um, series of records that we hold are occupation records. And so if there's someone that you might be researching throughout the course of your studies who was a government employee or a government official, then we should hold the records of their employment. So teachers, government employed <laughs> teachers, uh, doctors, pharmacists, accountants, all of these occupations had to go through some form of government assessment or government registration. And so as a result of that, we hold the records of those occupations. So in the left-hand side of your screen there is an excerpt from what we call our teacher's roles, which date from 1869 through to 1908. And they will typically provide you with the name of someone and then the description of their career as it progressed throughout the teaching, um, their teaching history. What schools they taught at, when they moved, when they moved to the next school, uh, when they married potentially, particularly in the case of women, and so on. And then on the right hand side um, is uh, an example of our series of records called doctor's photographs. And so the Medical Registration Board, when it was registering doctors, of course had to make sure that they were actually registering authentic doctors. So the best way of doing that to ensure that there wasn't an imposter at any stage was to, for the government to retain a photo of the person who had been registered as a doctor. And so on the right hand side of your screen you can see um, Elsie Daniel, who became a doctor but who also was a teacher. So she had both careers um, there. And Elsie Daniel is one of the people who uh, features uh, in the uh, what's called the Rachel Forster Hospital, which is part of a, our exhibition coming up after this current captured exhibition. Yeah. Uh, but these doctors' photos typically date from the 1890s onwards when the Medical Registration Board was getting going. This is an example of the jail photograph description book so that Penny will talk about, um, the actual mug shots, if you like. And we've just pulled out as that the example of a, someone famous, Chili Devine, there. But as you'll hear from Penny in a couple of minutes, the captured <coughs> exhibition, we've deliberately not featured the famous people who were in jail, or the infamous people who went to jail. Because what we discovered when we were doing the research of all of the case studies that we wanted to feature in the exhibition is that these were just ordinary people. They weren't famous, they weren't infamous, and their stories were such that had, they had been buried over time. And we have brought those to light um, through the exhibition and through the research that we've done through these. Everyone has kind of heard of or knows of around Tilly Devine and Kate Lee. 
we do have some international students in the room okay. as well, so you might just give them a tiny... Um, so, so essentially, uh, raise again. Kate Lee and Tilly Devine were two women who, if you like, um, ran the um, gangs in the inner city areas of Sydney, uh, in the night, primarily in the 1920s. Um, ran brothels, ran organised crime um, at that Alcohol. period of time. Alcohol. During prohibition. There's a wide variety. Um, and of course, uh, at various times, spent time in jail. Um, and so this is the, the jail record that we have of Matilda, or as she was known, Tilly Devine. I won't go into the jail photograph description books anymore because Penny will cover that. But just briefly before I finish off, how to access the New South Wales State Archives is, of course, one of the main things we need to cover off. First of all, we have our main reading room at Kingswood uh, near Penrith, where we have around 30,000 visitors a year come to look at the State Archives collection. Most of those people doing family history, but also local history and other specialised research. We also have 40 community access points around New South Wales that holds uh, a kit of copied material from that State Archives collection, which is the most popular records we hold, for want of a better expression. So our convict records, our shipping records, our land records. And the University of Newcastle is one of those community access points and also one of our regional archive centres throughout the state, which holds the core of the most popular state archives, but also uh, state archives of regional significance. Um, so uh, here at the university, you act as both the community access point and the regional <coughs> archive centre. Of course, we also have a website, which is one of the most popular state government uh, websites, uh, where we have a wide variety of material about the state archives collection, including a lot of online indexes. And these jail photograph description books, which Penny will talk about, um, we have recently digitised uh, 46,000 of those. And we have an online index that you can search and link that to digital images for each one of those 46,000 images. And of course, one of the best ways that we can increase awareness um, and use of the State Archives collection is to curate and to interpret our collection. And we're doing that through our exhibitions such as Captured, um, which we're delighted to have here um, again at the, another exhibition here at the university. Um, and we have an ongoing exhibitions program which uh, is both available on site um, at a Western Sydney location, not always our own, um, online, um, having e-catalogues and so on as a way of bringing those exhibitions to life, and also on tour. And Captured being at the University of Newcastle is an example of an exhibition that uh, we've brought on tour uh, to, to uh, really highlight those parts of the State Archives collection. That's all I really wanted to cover um, in this. I hope that that's given you a broad introduction to the State Archives collection. Uh, and I'll now hand over to our exhibition curator, Dr Penny Stennard, who has led uh, the exhibitions program at State Archives for the last two years. Um, and in particular, has led uh, the, the whole research behind, the whole uh, methodology behind the captured exhibition, um, which is has received really uh, worldwide attention um, in terms of media attention uh, for uh, it, primarily, I guess, because it's a great combination of wonderful information, but also the images that we can't go past. Penny. It's really great to be here. I was here last year um, when we had a, a touring exhibition called Windows into Wartime. So with the touring exhibitions, what they are is a smaller edition of um, a larger exhibition that we have at Kingswood or in a, a, Sydney, um, a Sydney venue. Um, I believe that um, you're, you're dealing with the concept of um, a criminal underbelly. Is that correct? Yes. And so when I started thinking about this exhibition and the sorts of stories and people we might profile in this, um, I knew about the Tilly Divines, I knew about the Jimmy, Jimmy Governors, I knew about the sort of uh, the Razor Games and, and all of those TV, uh, TV series that have been uh, quite popular over the last couple of years. So those kind of infamous um, criminal milieu uh, sort of uh, dramatisations of um, real events. And I was tasked with um, delivering an exhibition in just nine months 
working with a data set of 46,000 records. And those records were essentially, um, as you would have seen from the example of Tilly Devine, um, pages that had um, photographic images of a person and then textual information. And so 46,000 pages of those, and I had to get to an exhibition and have an exhibition launch within nine months. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and I said to Martin, who's got I said, never again. Um, it was an incredibly intense um, project to work through, and I had to come up with a really rigorous methodology to deal with um, the constraints that that presented to me. And I'll talk about that shortly, but I want you to think about the fact that, um, you know, an exhibition um, is one platform of actually presenting research findings or research outcomes. And it can be a really creative and wonderful way to work in a very, very collaborative way. And so that's the sort of thing I've tried to do, is to use the exhibitions as a form of publishing research outcomes. Um, and I just wanted to start off my talk today by thinking about, um, you know, underbelly infamy and that kind of thing. And one of my colleagues actually drew this to my attention. So um, Michel Foucault um, wrote an essay called uh, Lives of Infamous Men. And he found that true infamy, mixed neither with ambiguous scandal nor with secret admiration, compounds no kind of glory. And true infamy can only be found attached to otherwise obscure lives. Lives which are as though they hadn't existed. Lives which only exist from the clash with a power whose only wish was to annihilate or at least to efface them. Brief lives chanced upon in books and documents, whose poetry consisted in the few words through which they avoided oblivion and became part of recorded history. So th this exhibition is not about the infamous. It's about the ordinary. Now, what I found was in looking at the stories, I realised that they were extraordinary. Their ordinariness made them extraordinary. So the exhibition captured portraits of crime. Um, I'm going to take you through a whole series of images, but I want you to remember that I don't, they're not just mugshots, because the records that I've been working with are a combination of image and text. Both are important. And I'll tell you how those records came into being and what the thinking was um, by authorities in relation to marrying text, textual information with image. And it was quite a radical development at the time. So, going back to 1869, the New South Wales Government commissioned the then Inspector of Prisons, a fellow called Harold Maclean, to examine the workings of prison establishments in the United Kingdom. So he got to go overseas uh, on a study tour funded by the government. And he visited prisons in England, Scotland and Ireland, and he paid particular attention to several principles, and one was the principle of isolating prisoners. Another was um, the principle of separating prisoners. Another was um, labour, prison labour and productivity um, and how prisons could actually um, be sort of sites of productivity and, and what that meant in terms of then um, the development of the colony back home. And he recommended five objectives that the government implement. So four of them dealt with productivity in prisons, the separation and isolation of prisoners. And then the fifth one was the, the loose cannon. It was quite different. It was that images, photographic images, be taken of prisoners to assist in suppressing crime. You've got to remember in 1869, photographic technology was pretty new, certainly in New South Wales. And a year after making this recommendation, so he'd come back to New South Wales, he told his superiors what he found, and he recommended that New South Wales' principal prison at the time, which was Darlinghurst Jail, take photographic portraits of prisoners at the point, or very close to the point, which they entered uh, the prison system. Within a couple of years, that rolled out across all the prisons in New South Wales. It rolled out firstly in what are called the uh, principal prisons. So some of the ones we know today, Goulburn, um, uh, uh, Darlinghurst, as I said, was the one. Grafton was one. Berrimer was another one. So the big kind of prisons at the time. Um, but his direction built on some earlier reforms from 1967, and that was um, a reform that was rolled in by the government to actually have description books in jails. So that's where you see um, all the jails in New South Wales having the, the physical description of the prisoner 
um, any distinguishing marks, so similar to what we saw in that um, earlier convict record. So with the introduction of uh, photographic portraits, the idea was that image and information would combine and it would create this new biography, this new record of a convicted offender. And here are some examples. So they exist on what, does everyone know what, what I say a full size page? That's slightly bigger than, uh, longer than A4? And these are the sorts of records um, that I was looking with. And you can see very much that it's that combination of image material and textual material. And it's that marrying together that I was really interested in, in terms of how that might hint at a story, how that might hint as, as something unique. So the question I had was, um, you know, of these 46,000 digitised records, um, there was a, there's a renewed interest in this kind of material combined with sort of the contemporary interest in true crime. So what could we glean from what I would call these brief biographies? How does the melding of image and information hint at the circumstances and events that led up to a person's conviction and incarceration? Where did these prisoners come from and why were they incarcerated in New South Wales jails? And then taking a sort of macro look, what does all of this tell us about the changes and developments that were taking place in New South Wales over 60 years? So the set of records that I worked with covered about 1871, 72, up to 1930. So think about, in terms of your knowledge of New South Wales history, in terms of your knowledge of general history, the kind of changes that would have happened between 1870 and 1930. And we start to see from looking at these records that sense of how technology changed lives, a sense of how trauma changed lives, and that sort of types of crimes that were committed were very much linked to those kind of macro and structural developments taking place um, in New South Wales, but globally as well. So these are the sorts of questions that I really wanted to engage in in terms of developing an exhibition. And I wanted to move a, away from a way of working that is based on, you know, selecting an image because, gee, this guy's got a cool moustache, or gee, he looks like a gangster, and actually having real rigour um, and thinking through why we might choose a particular case to explore. Um, one of the things that interested me was when I came across very old um, people who were incarcerated in prison. And I came across this fellow, William Plummer or John Plummer. And he was an interesting one because you know, he was an old man by the time uh, this record was created. And he was a man who I wondered, given the time frames, whether or not he'd been a transported convict. Um, and so starting to look into him, he, he certainly was a transported convict. Um, and so we started to flesh out the story. And one of the things that I found quite compelling about this one was in the, um, so this little area on these forms, it's where the uh, jailer can write whether or not they had descriptive tattoos, whether or not they had particular scars, whether or not they were missing a finger, whether or not they had a limp. Some cases, um, their Aboriginality was noted. So it's a fairly kind of mixed bag as to what you might find in there. And what we find for this fellow is we find that he had flagellation scars on his back and we find that he also had a very unique uh, series of letters tattooed um, on him. And what I was also lucky to find um, in our collection is we still have some of the original glass plate negatives. So even though I was dealing with these paper records that have now been digitised, we actually had, in some cases, the original negative. And that was incredible to find that. So what I'm showing you here is I'm showing you the negative of William Plummer and then I'm showing you how that, that comes out then as a contact print in terms of his um, jail photographic description record. Short story, he was a silversmith. He was convicted um, of um, stealing in um, the UK, was transported out here, found himself um, assigned to James MacArthur, the son of John MacArthur. And then from that sort of time up until when he died, he was in and out of um, institutions, incarcerated for stealing, burglary, that kind of thing. He would be given a ticket of leave, then he would do something, and that was revoked. And so, in some ways, you sort of come to a conclusion that he was a fellow who stealing and deceit were just a part of his life, and that was just how he lived his life. And, um, you know, he committed crimes at the time, but you are filled with empathy, I suppose, when you look at such an old man. Um, being incarcerated in his elderly years yet again. So he was one real link to um, the, um, you know, when New South Wales um, was a, um, you know, that, that era of transport, convict transportation, a penal colony. And here, what we've been able to do with the digitisation, so we've, in the case of this, we have 
the paper record, the, the, the digitisation of this, the original glass plate negative, which we then can scan and then turn into a positive. And what you see is you get a very pure image. And they're great because when they can be scanned, the, the image is so pure that they can be really uh, enlarged. And they're almost cinematographic. Um, and the glass plate technology is incredible. It's only really in fairly recent years that we've actually got the digital technology to realise the full spectrum of the glass plate. So the glass plates are wonderful to work with if you get the opportunity. So I had 46,000 records um, spanning 60 years. They came from 199 volumes. They represented 20 jars across New South Wales. I had nine months to deliver an exhibition. So I couldn't do it um, alone. So I had to find, as I said, a way to make the selection and work out some kind of methodology and systematised way of shortlisting from these 46,000 records. So I tasked 17 archivists with actually working through probably about 1,500 records each. And what I did was I worked across that 60 year period and looked at the jails that were open and closed during that period, got a representation from what I call the principal and the minor jails. I didn't use the police jails. So there were police jails all over the place in little towns. So I didn't go with those, I just went with the two top eras. And um, so I got that shortlist down to about 9,000. So then I brought the 17 archivists on board to do that. And I asked them to, as they click on the, the digital image and it opened up, I asked them to come back to me with a reason why they found that record compelling or not. And it was really interesting because 17 different people <laughs> found different things compelling. For me, I found when I clicked on it, it opened and it was a boy who was put in a, you know, seven years hard labour in a big prison. I found that quite hard to deal with. For others, it was um, you know, women who obviously were victims of domestic violence. For some, it was um, old men. For others, it was where you'd open it up and then there'd be several more pages just of years and years of crime. So according to the different experiences of people, different people found things compelling, and you will too, once I start um, getting you into the exhibition, into the images. And so as well as delivering an exhibition, I had to deliver across three simultaneous platforms. So an ex a main exhibition at the State Archives at Kingswood, a smaller touring exhibition, and an online exhibition. And I chose to do that through the form of an e-book or an e-catalogue. And I'm just going to take you through some of the images because they are incredible. Um, we can say that an image tells a thousand words. I would say, yes, that's the case. But we also have the textual information. When you see a grey image, that's where I've worked from a glass plate negative. So we found the paper record and then we've gone to a different set of records and we've actually been able to find the glass plate negative and digitise that. So Margaret Higgins, she was from Maitland um, and she was photographed at Dubbo Jail in October 1905 while serving a life sentence for murder. What you also see is you see two images. So the type of camera that they use, there are two lenses. So if you look really carefully, it's a slightly different, like a Mona Lisa. It's a slightly different, um, bit, uh, they're looking slightly differently. And, you know, she looks pretty sad. She was 45 years old. She'd been um, sentenced for murder. She was found uh, guilty of killing her one-month-old grandchild who had been born to her unmarried daughter. Both women were charged uh, with the murder. The, her daughter, who was 20, um, died in, um, in custody from a post-birth um, infection. So Margaret was left to uh, face jury. Um, and we've got court records um, as well, and there's lots in trial you can look at as well. So judges' notebooks, um, depositions, that kind of thing. And the sorts of things that were talked about during her trial was that um, she was called half-witted, she was called not quite right in the mind, um, and so back then, if someone was given a, a found guilty of murder, it was an automatic death penalty. Jurors, were, however, a jury was able to um, uh, petition that uh, mercy be shown to the person. And so in this case, because she was known to be half-witted um, and someone who, um, I guess, um, you know, wasn't quite right in their mind, the, the jury um, urged that mercy be shown. And so she wasn't uh, given the death penalty. Um, she was, um, that was well, she was given it and it was commuted. Um, this picture was taken on the day she was given the death penalty. So read that into her face. 
Arthur Astle. How old's Arthur Astle? He wants to take a punt. About 12 or 13, maybe. There's lots of boys. Arthur Astle, 16 years old, from the Central West, photographed at Dubbo Jail in 1893 whilst awaiting trial for murder. So he was a boy who was um, living with a farmer and his wife. Um, the farmer went out one day and um, the, his wife, the farmer's wife was shot. Um, Arthur was the key suspect. He was the only other person around the farmhouse at the time. Um, he kept changing his story, unfortunately. It didn't look good. Um, so he was charged with her murder. What was really interesting about Arthur was that we did actually find the judge's notebooks. And there's all this kind of sexual in innuendo that the judge writes about Arthur, about how he used to like going out and getting with the girls and all these kind of moral judgments. And, you know, the judge actually noting whether or not he was having an affair with the farmer's wife and maybe that was a motive for killing her, that kind of thing. When Arthur finally told the truth, the truth, according to him, was that um, the farmer's wife was outside. She saw a hawk. She yelled out to Arthur to go and get a gun and shoot the hawk. And he tripped over a pet kangaroo and it caused the gun to misfire and shoot her. So that was his uh, truth. That's what he um, told the authorities eventually. Um, and he was found not guilty. Now, he was found not guilty because the jury had not reach verdict. Arthur Astor went on to have a very large family, about 10 or 11 children. Several of those children became lawyers and or barristers. Quite interesting. He doesn't appear in um, any of our records again in terms of jail records. And I opened him up, and as soon as I opened Arthur and saw a PV offence murder, and I saw this angelic boy, that if you actually sort of looked from here up, you could be a picture of the boy today. There was that conflict. How could such an angelic looking boy be charged with murder, but he was? This fellow, Mitchell Ryan. Mitchell Ryan was um, someone who committed what we call white collar crimes or um, uh, currency related crimes. So there were five types of crime categories um, that I uh, used to assess um, or to get a, cro a cross section of criminal activity. So under the 1901 no, 1901 Crimes Act, 1900. So there's crimes against the person. So there you murder, you rape, you manslaughter, you GBH. Crimes against property. So you're stealing, you're thieving, you're injuring sheep, that kind of thing. Um, Offences against currency. So that's what you call your white collar crime. Fraud, that sort of stuff. Um, petty crimes. So low level, riotous behaviour drunken, disorderly, vagrancy. And then there's weird and wonderful um, kind of infringement type crimes. So, um, you know, cutting a rabbit proof fence, damaging it, like actually that was, a, that was a very serious offence. But, you know, fish, selling fish without a licence, that kind of stuff. So there are five crime categories. And Mitchell Ryan fell under um, offences against currency, so false pretences. Now he was a fellow, his story is interesting, um, but his images are compelling. And he was one who, as you can see, I was able to find the glass plates of. And I do also encourage you to look not just at the person's face, but all the stuff that exists around it. So in terms of the actual physical object of the glass plate. And what you see here is groups of five. So what happened was when their portrait was taken, 25 copies of um, the portrait were produced just in case they committed other crimes, just in case they were needed again. And so what we see on these glass plates is we see this telling up of the 25. And that's very interesting. And I'll show you some more where you see how they kind of... Detritus, I'm not quite sure what the word is, but how the, how, how the actual physical record was used. And they show up you know, really beautifully in some of the digitisations. I kind of like he could be a villain from James Bond. His so story's really sad. So he worked on a farm. There was a phosphorus fire in a barn or a shed and he tried. He ran in and tried to put it out and he suffered horrific burns. Mm -hmm. Now phosphorus is something that um, causes people to have very severe corneal, corneal you know, damage to the eye. So remembering that this was a time before workers' compensation, this mm -hmm. was, you know, he was injured at work. Um, he would have been in excruciating pain. Did he commit these offences because he actually um, needed money? 
you know, he had no other means to support himself. I don't know. Um, but you can see in terms of, you know, it, they're very compelling images. Um, and he was in and out of jail probably over about a 25 year period from Broken Hill to Parramatta to Grafton. Here's another one again from a glass plate, and this is from 1888 in Parramatta. This fellow, George Hopp, was convicted for a sex offence against a child. So um, it was very confronting looking at these records. There was a lot of um, sexual offences against children and minors and the kind of penalties differed. So if a child was aged under four, the child was aged under ten, uh, the sentences differed. Um, so he was, um, I think he was of the less serious, so probably under, uh, under ten. He had committed this offence um, on a child who was probably between ten and about fourteen. Um, and he was sentenced to two years hard labour. Um, he died five months after that photo was taken, so he actually died in Parramatta Jail. Um, and there was inquiry um, at the time as to whether or not the jail authorities had actually cared for him properly. And it was found that he died of some kind of uh, septicemia. He looks like an unwell man. He doesn't look well. Actually, when you first put the photo up, I thought he was blind because the, cause he's not looking at the camera. Yeah, he's, he's unwell. And the other thing to remember is that, you know, back in these days, so this was taken in 1888, people were not used to sitting in front of the camera. Mm. People used, you know, and once you start, once you look at the really early ones, and I'll show you even early ones, they're very stiff, they're very formal, the camera took a long time to take the image, and people just weren't used to a camera. By the 20s, they're relaxed. You see a real difference. And I'll show you, you'll, you'll, start, to, you'll start to read these yourself. So he looks unwell. On his um, description page, under the section um, distinct, uh, uh, distinguishing features, it talks about that he was deformed in both feet. That's interesting. Who'd like to guess how old Frederick Higgins is? Nine. Yeah. Nine? Good guess. That's what I thought too. It's actually 17. Oh, Seriously? No. This is what I mean. There were lots of boys. And you just think, what? And they were, you know, for a, for a long time they were um, in prison with adults. So Frederick Higgins stealing three months hard labour. This photo was taken in 1908 in Grafton, um, and he gave his age of 17. Whether or not that was the case, I don't know, but you do wonder. He doesn't look 17 to me. And you can also see again, I talked about the information and the, and the way that the record was used. So we see engraved his name there. We see the word Higgins and and we see the telling up of the number of prints that would have been made from the negative. This fellow here, he's an interesting guy because he was actually in prison for disturbing a congregation. So there were um, crimes back in the 1800s and even in our own recent memory that are no longer, uh, no longer considered offences today and disturbing a congregation was a very serious offence. So he disturbed a congregation, so a church meeting. Um, and he was sentenced to seven years hard labour. Prior to that, he had some form for assault and robbery. William Jones was photographed in 1888 in Parramatta. Here's an interesting one because it's a bit hard to see in here, but you can see fingerprints of the person who's handled the negative. So again, it's part of that sort of the real tangible material qualities of the record. And so that's William Jones, pretty ordinary, except for the fact that from today's perspective, disturbing a congregation certainly wouldn't get seven years hard labour. I just want to show you these ones. So now we go to the sepia tones. This is where the image comes from the page itself. Um, so again, with a high uh, resolution digitisation, we can then blow them up. And um, this fellow, whose name was uh, Edmund Jones, Look, he had a fairly long history of vagrancy, indecent assault of girls, um, careless use of fire, obscene language, in and out of prison over about 20 years. Um, and you see that. You see that this is a guy who's had it tough. His vagrancy is what we call homelessness today. Um, you know, what I call one of those kind of sad cases. And the majority of... 46,000 crimes that are represented in these records um, are those kind of minor offences. So some things haven't changed. Going back and looking at statistics over this 60-year period, 
The majority of uh, crimes were committed by men aged 18 to 35. The majority of uh, crimes committed were um, the lower order crimes, so drunk and disorderly, assault, riotous behaviour, vagrancy. The murders, the uh, manslaughters, they're the minority. But what we see is, because they're the more serious crimes, they're tried in the Supreme Court. So there's the, they're tried in the highest court, and so there's the records... So the ones that are tried in, like, a police court, generally the records... They might, not have, you know, they might have been destroyed. The same kind of records weren't kept. If they're tried for murder in the Supreme Court, it's a different kind of record keeping. And so they're the kind of records that are kept. The kind of lower level crimes, the records aren't necessarily kept. Um, but you know, some, things, some things haven't changed. This is a really interesting case. This is uh, Willie Cannonbury. And Willie and his uh, friend, or his offside, Jackie, um, they were both Aboriginal men and they were convicted of murder at, um, and sentenced to death and their trial uh, took place in 1894 in Albury um, and we have uh, Willie aged in his early 20s here. Um, and this was a story that, uh, so Willie and Jackie were two uh, trackers, uh, police trackers. They were originally from Fraser Island. They were brought down to work in Victoria by the Victorian police. For some reason, the Victorian police thought that Queensland trackers were better than any others. So they were sort of contracted, I suppose we would uh, say today, to come and work in uh, Victoria for a year on the promise that then after a year they'd be released and they could go back home. So a year came and went and they weren't, they weren't released. So Jackie and Willie decided to leave um, and they crossed into New South Wales from Albury. And then there was a series of events. And it, they became the prime suspects in the death of a Polish farmer around um, the Al Albury area in a place called Dora Dora. They became um, the key suspects due to witnesses describing foreign fellows being in the area. Um, and they were on the run. And they obviously were making their way back up to Queensland. And they escaped authorities for about three years. And it's really interesting. The story's been completely lost, but there was great moral panic in you know, all sorts of parts of sort of western New South Wales going up into southern Queensland because these men just were able to evade authorities. So they had superior bush skills. There were also reports of um, the assault of a girl. Um, there were reports of um, money being stolen, that kind of thing. So this whole kind of mythology built up about um, these two gentlemen. They were eventually uh, hunted down and caught in the Bundaberg area in Queensland, but one of them was, I think it was Willie, and they were extradited back to Albury to face trial. Um, Willie was caught first, and then Jackie, who was a few years older, was caught uh, secondly. And Jackie had been apprehended a couple of times and put in irons, but he escaped. Um, and so they had this, uh, this mythology about their bush survival skills and what incredible um, uh, physical skills they had. The really interesting thing about this one is that um, so not only was there this kind of three-year story um, about them, uh, once they were caught and tried for murder, the community of Albury got together to appeal the death sentence because they felt that these guys actually weren't cunning criminals. They weren't your typical criminal. And they'd actually, um, it, it was promised that they would be released after a year, um, and that promise wasn't uh, held. Um, and the um, community of Albury, so the aldermen and other prominent people got together and made petitions to uh, the Executive Council to have these men uh, not executed, but uh, sentenced in the case of, um, oh, sentenced to life imprisonment. So they were imprisoned uh, for life. After um, 15 years, Willie was released. This photo was taken the day of his release. Now, when I was reading off about this case, I was able to find some information that suggested that for um, Aboriginal men and women, once they were incarcerated in a prison, they usually then um, only survived for about seven years. Woody survived for 15 years, and he was released and um, made his way back up to Queensland. And from that point, I don't know what happened next. Jackie was released about 18 years later, and he was quite sick by the time he was released. And he was accompanied back to Queensland um, to be put under the, uh, under the um, watch of the protector of Aboriginal <coughs> Um, now, when I was um, at the State Library looking into this and I was um, reading about 
how the community of Albury came together to um, petition uh, that their sentences be commuted. They had a list of names of all the men from Albury who had written letters um, in support of their case, and the last name I came across was actually someone I was I am a descendant of. <laughs> so I was very surprised. <laughs> and so these kind of serendipitous things uh, can happen when you're doing this kind of research. Um, so that's Willie, and it was just incredible to find that we had an image of him the day he was released after 15 years in prison. John Mason, it's a very affecting image, this one. So here's a fellow who was convicted of bestiality, um, and he, he was uh, found not guilty on the grounds of um, what was then called insanity. So if someone was found not guilty on the grounds of insanity, then their sentence, they were given a sentence called... Um, Governor's Pleasure. So that was an indeterminate period of time. And they were put in um, like a criminal institution. Um, and then the governor would review their case um, now and again um, and release them if they were found um, to no longer be a danger to the community. Um, so this fellow, he was from uh, the Windsor area in New South Wales. Um, he was diagnosed at the time, so this is language of the time. Uh, of 1901 to be a high-class imbecile under the Lunacy Act of 1898. Um, and he was found to be unsound of uh, unsound mind and therefore declared to be insane. So back in those days, um, if someone had uh, a particular syndrome uh, that today we might call a developmental disability, they were still declared to be, uh, under the Lunacy Act, declared to be insane. So there wasn't a difference between... Um, wasn't understood that there was a difference that there was a difference between someone having experiencing a mental illness and someone who had a developmental disability. And what you see with John Mason, I believe, is someone who has a developmental disability. Mm -hmm. um, he was released after two years and um, sent back into the care of his parents. What also is amazing about these records is that we have lots of people who are repeat offenders. And <coughs> They're in and out of jail over 30 years or more in some cases. And at various times their photograph is taken and you can start to piece together a photographic biography of their life. They often change names, sometimes up to 35, 40 different aliases. But here we have Sarah Clifford and she there's a connection to Newcastle with Sarah Clifford. She's one of the earliest records we have. So this, this one here, photo, is 1872. She was born in Jamaica. Know how that happened, um, but she ended up in um, Hobart. So she was a, um, a transported convict, uh, ended up in uh, Hobart, um, and then she. Um, oh, it's a really sad story. I won't go into it. I can talk about it a bit later, but she basically her crime was pickpocketing. She made her way from. Um, she served her time in Hobart. She got involved with a man who was also um, kind of more. He was a pickpocket, but he was more violent. They made their way up to Newcastle, and by the time they made their way up to Newcastle, about 10 years after she had left Hobart, um, they were um, implicated in uh, you know, various crimes, but there was something at the time where if a, if a wife committed a crime with a husband, it was thought that the husband was at fault rather than the wife, and she was co coerced. So she did do to Bailey for a while because she was the wife of um, another criminal. But pickpocketing was her thing. She moved to Sydney and she would operate um, on the fine streets of Sydney um, wearing a black cloak. Um, she would kind of hang around women who would be um, window shopping. Um, she would steal their purses. At the end of the day, she'd go to a hotel room. She'd lay out her purses on her bed. She'd take the goodies and then make you know, run off and leave the empty purses. She had such a reputation that country visitors to Sydney were warned about the wily old woman in black. So we've got the first photo taken in 1872, the last one <coughs> taken in 1910. She died in 1913. It, it's an incredible series of images and it's incredible that someone lived their life like this. The really sad thing for me um, with this one, and my colleague, I had a, a, one of the archivists doing a lot of the research on this one, was that her son also followed in her ways. And he had his first conviction for pickpocketing at the age of eight. So that kind of intergenerational uh, activity. So she's a really incredible example of someone who 
we can get a sense of their life and their ageing over time because she was photographed in and out of jail over 40, about 40 years. We also get the, the same with this fellow, um, Pierre McDoon. McDoon is a completely made up name. We don't know where it comes from. Um, we believe that, well, he's, he, he's, he's an interesting guy. Was he, was he Indian? Uh, and other uh, reports talked about him as being from um, Pacific. Um, who knows? Um, but what we do know about him was that his first uh, sort of institutionalisation was at the age of 15. Um, he got involved with a, a sort of gang in, in the city of Sydney and then he was sent to one of the, the boys' institutions, one of the nautical training schools. Um, he was so small at the age of 15 when he first went into the institution that it was assumed he was 10. He was someone who, um, his mother had died, his father was a cook um, living overseas, so he was on his own. He's an interesting one because he only ever did one thing. That was crimes to do with horses. He stole horses. He rode horses. He stealed four horses. It was all horse related. And sort of by the time we go from him being a young man in the 1880s to 1913, body was covered with images of horses. He would have been jockey sized. So in another life, would he have been a jockey? He loved horses. Obsessed, loved, yes. And these records from 1913, so you got around the battalion systems coming in. Are these, are these just, are these um, conviction sheets, etc.? Yeah. Are they just for the institution they're going, or are they centralised by that time? So my understanding is that that's institution by institution. Yeah, so you, what, what you do find, um, so in the case, um, there must have been coordination because the, the later records you start to. So the different uh, jails that someone's been in start to be listed. And you got telegraphed and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And so the idea telegraphed. was that the 25 copies were made to distribute out as well. Sure. Um, so you do start to see things becoming more systematised. And you start to see fingerprinting coming in fairly soon as well. Um, but he's an interesting guy um, as well just because horse, horses. Horses were his passion, his addiction, whatever. It was all about the horse. He went all over New South Wales committing crimes associated with horses. <coughs> And again, we see him ageing, and that earliest image is taken in 1895. And you can see again where I've been able to find the glass of chrome because that's where you see the grey image as opposed to the sepia. Agnes Marshall. Okay, so she's a woman, first conviction, age 13, for uh, vagrancy. She, first image on the top left, taken in 1893, last image taken in 1929. So she's a woman who had lots of aliases, Agnes D'Souza, Agnes Jones, Agnes Marshall, and her and her sister um, would sort of flirt with well-to-do men um, and then uh, steal from them and get them drunk and friendly and then they'd commit their crime. Um, she's got pages and pages of offences. Most of it is vacancy, decent language, drunk, righteous behaviour, for this one taken in 1929, she was sentenced to seven years hard labour for inflicting grievous bodily harm. Mm. Don't know how she did it because she looks pretty old and frail. Her occupation is all is either married woman or domestic duties. Um, it was quite confronting to find this one of her in 1929. Uh, it's clearly she is clearly someone who um, uh, is, is positive. Possibly an Aboriginal person, possibly a South Sea Islander person, we don't know. Uh, another really interesting thing about these records is how things like Aboriginality are recorded. So sometimes in the, on the sheet, um, so in the case of Willie, the Aboriginal fellow I showed you, it, under his name it has Willie Kenamurray. So there's like a spelling of his tribal name. And in descriptive marks it talks about tribal, tribal stars. Others, um, Aboriginality is noted as a distinguishing feature. Um, the language of the time, the, so people were talked about as being half castes or quarter castes. Um, in other cases, Aboriginality is recorded as a religion, or it would be something like pagan. Uh, in other cases, it's not recorded at all, although the person is clearly an Indigenous Australian. So that's also, there's a whole kind of study there for someone to do about how Aboriginality is. Um, Recorded in these records. So moving on to this lovely woman, Eileen Mulholland. She's, 
just so beautiful. And it looks so sunny. But she had a long criminal history. And she was someone who today you would probably call a kleptomaniac. She could not help herself from stealing. She only stole from the well to do. She stole high quality stuff. Um, and she stole from the good suburbs of Sydney. She, uh, she tried to reform. Her husband tried to reform her. It was some kind of illness. Who knows? But she was in and out of prison. She also had several aliases. Um, and she just couldn't stop herself. She would, she would say in her, in her trials that she can't stop herself. Um, and then we found this incredible image that was held by the historic uh, Sydney Living Museums. And they have a collection of uh, negatives taken of um, people when they entered a, like a police uh, station and they were held in custody. And when I saw this and we made the connection that it was in fact the same person, I just found that an incredible uh, image to see because we have this lovely, sunny, beautiful young woman on the one hand and then we have this, this person here and the contrast is incredible. And starting to look at her story, I mean, it, it, was, it was complex. She obviously had some kind of uh, major issue that she, could, she just couldn't overcome. Um, and she lost custody of her, her child. Her husband tried to divorce her several times and he was eventually successful. So that was Eileen. And then we moved to um, the Roaring Twenties. And as I said before, that by this stage, people are much more used to standing in front of a camera. And what also changed at this time was um, not only was the photo taken sort of with the, the midriff up, but you also got photos of their whole body and also photos of their side. And these were taken in broken film of these photos, but what you see in some of the ones that were taken at big jails like um, Long Bay, you see like a, a, a measuring stick to, to measure their height as well. So you're starting to see this, this more detailed information being taken uh, through the um, photographic but I just love these guys. So we've got Jim Skidmore on the left. And for me, when I looked at that, I thought, wow, he's a pretty cool guy. Kind of movie star. We all liked him. And he's offside of Roy Davidson. So Roy and Jim were done for stealing a car uh, near Broken Hill. And um, they'd been working on one of the big sheep stations. They decided to go driving in a very nice car. And as they tried to cross the Darling River, of course, the car stalled. They couldn't start it and they were apprehended. Now, of course, they said that and just trying it out. The judge didn't believe them and the judge felt that um, this is happening all too much. We've got young men stealing cars. Let's, I'm going to set an example. So he sentenced um, them to six months hard labour. And a report at the time talks about how when the judge read the verdict out, Jim Skidmore stood up and asked the judge to repeat it and he was so shocked he couldn't believe it. He sort of said, you're joking, aren't you? And the judge said, no, 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 I'm making an example of you. Now, this, this guy had previous, but this was apparently Jim Skidmore's first offence. Now, I did wonder about that, given that his um, uh, special, um, uh, just special markings talk about that he had two bullet wounds in the leg. <laughs> and I did check whether or not he was a World War I uh, veteran, and he wasn't. So you do wonder. Um, whether or not he uh, was actually as innocent as uh, perhaps was suggested. Um, so anyway, so they served their time. Now, Jim Skidmore, Skidmore's a pretty unusual name, so I thought, oh, he'll be easy to track. We'll see what happened to him next. Well, it seems that the name Jim Skidmore is from some kind of joke that was going around um, sort of in the years earlier to do with copyright, and there's all these kind of jokes around the name Jim Skidmore. So anyway, so I did some digging around. Oh, and I've, I haven't bought this one, but I found him again as James Campbell. And it seems that 18 months after he finished his sentence at Broken Hill, he found his way to Sydney um, and he continued criminal activity. And what we find is that seriousness um, increased. So this one is starting with you know, illegal use of a car. And within about five years, it was um, attempted uh, shooting with intent to murder, cocaine, that kind of stuff. Um, so James Campbell's a pretty common name. Um, I sort of gave up on the search after I found his a long day jail record. So he perhaps wasn't as innocent as you would think. But just these are great because they've got such attitude. They're dandies. Um, they were guys who were also involved in, you know, fast cars, stealing. And what you also see is in these uh, sets of records, you know, in the 1880s, 1890s, young men are being done for horse stealing, riding off on a horse, stealing a cart. By the time the motor car comes in, that's gone. It's all about the car. 
It's about stealing cars, the occupations, the chauffeurs, wheel mechanics, tyre mechanics. It just almost, you know, changes overnight. So we see how technology also changes um, criminal offending. This one's a Newcastle one, just for you. She's an interesting lady dressed as a nurse. So, Yelena Orchard, she was uh, convicted of the Maitland Jail image. She was convicted for impersonating, obtaining money under false pretenses. So the story is that she um, pretended to be a nurse at Newcastle Hospital and she um, went up to people and collected money from patients. Um, she was obviously found out, found out that she actually wasn't a nurse and, um, and she was sentenced to six months hard labour. We don't know too much more about Delia except that we believe she um, originally oh, she was from New Zealand. Um, so you get these weird and wonderful kind of things happening as well. Um, whether or not she actually had trained as a nurse, we don't know, but she certainly um, felt that she had to. Or she, you know, she found a she found a, 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 a modus operandi. She had a business plan and it was successful at least for her for a short time. Then you come across these kind of images, um, which are pretty kind of confronting. So. And you start to, s so a lot of them are taken in sort of, you know, the jail block or whatever. But in some of them you start to see what's happening around the person. And obviously in this case you can see the policeman's holding his head up. So he was a fella who was, um, his name is Bernard Cunningham, age 35. The image was taken in Maitland Jail in 1916. And he had lines and lines of offences, vagrancy type offences. Um, and that's quite interesting too, reading around like, what's happening around the person. A lot of the ones from places like Broken Hill, the images taken of them standing in front of the corrugated iron gate. Um, the images taken, so the images were taken of them in their own clothes. And so that was something that was specified under the directions. So what you get in the case of someone who's, uh, for example, committed a white collar crime, so a professional person, they've had their trial, they've been found guilty, off they go to jail and they're still in their finery, their beautiful suit. Um, so, yeah, the idea was that you, the photo be taken off them in their own clothes as much as possible. And if you were doing an analysis of this material based on kind of clothing, that would be a really interesting study to do. It's a great indicator of social class, yes. Just want to ask you, the, like the New York's just done, these things are fantastic. You know, New York's done this massive digitisation. They've done another one in France too. And there was this thing that they found, I think it was Luke Somp that mentioned that. They found that it was interesting, there was a class element to this in that the, the more elevated the class was, probably the less um, intrusive the camera was. Okay, you, you know, I'm just wondering if you found something similar. Um, no, I didn't um, think of that angle. Um, and that's kind of beyond all the criminology of you know, the stats of who commits crimes, etc. Yeah. But certainly what you did find is that... Um, You had the more professional classes in general committing uh, the offences against currency. So you had people like, there was a town clerk, so what today we'd call a CEO or general manager of a big council. You had bank managers, you had company directors, um, you had ship's captains, so very respectable people. You had gentlemen, that kind of thing, and that would have been a massive fall from grace for those kind of people. Um, and then, you know, you get a lot of sort of what you know, could be referred to at the time as the lower social classes. And in fact, one of the interesting things about um, when this technology of photographing criminals was first introduced, there was a lot of debate. So it was introduced, I'll come back to you, it was introduced in France and the UK. Um, and in France, it was introduced in Paris because there was um, a new law brought in around um, sort of the homeless um, being considered criminals. And so the authorities, they knew the criminal classes, they knew the regulars, but they didn't know who all these um, kind of vagrants were. And so the French authorities or the Parisian authorities brought in photography purely um, from the point of view of um, this new vagrancy act that had been brought in because they just didn't know who people were. So there's the Netherlands around here, just yeah. Paris, yeah. In the UK it was slightly different. So what was happening in the UK was that criminals, the criminals, the sort of active criminals were moving from county to county. And so the only description that authorities had was the written description. So you had their height, their blue eyes or whatever. And so it was felt that by actually taking the image of them, that would help with um, stopping that kind of criminal activity. At the time when the technology was introduced in, um, particularly in the UK in about the 1850s, uh, or 1860s, 
um, there were debates around the use of photography on the criminal classes. So um, portrait photography was very much something that was the domain of the upper classes. It was, you go with your family, you have your, resp you know, you're respectable, you have your studio shot taken. And it was felt that by using that technology to photograph the criminal classes, that it would actually denigrate the, bour the bourgeois classes because they would be somehow connected. So there's debate around that. There's also a debate around um, that taking an image of someone would enshrine in perpetuity their crimi crimi criminality well before the only sentence was served. So it's a thinking that this permanent record was actually really unfair because someone might serve the sentence, but there was still this record for them, of them. So there were these interesting debates. By the time it came into New South Wales, you know, the technology was much more common um, and those debates had subsided. I'll finish up fairly shortly. The material, oh sorry, yes. Yeah, that guy in the previous picture, is he dead? Because it actually, the way his head's been held up, it looks no, like he's I'd, I'd say he's completely knocked out by um, whatever he's consumed. He's off his face. Well, if it was, I'd say that's what Maybe he's passed out from or something? I'd say so, yes. Because it was all um, sort of that kind of offending. So yeah, he looks dead. <laughs> This was a pretty confronting one. So we start to so when there's been times of global upheaval, First World War, uh, you start to see things coming, stories coming out of that to do with criminal offending. And this fellow, um, he was a Gallipoli veteran. Uh, the thing that I immediately noticed with this was this facial disfigurement. Just I think what's going on here. So we looked into the story, and I had one of the particular archivists who really took carriage of this, and she went into a lot of detail, and it was great. So he'd been a Gallipoli veteran, and when he was uh, at Gallipoli, he um, experienced um, an injury where a bullet, um, he was shot in the face, and the bullet exited his ear, and it basically took away half his nose and um, half his teeth. And he, um, this, you know, his injuries were very serious um, and life-threatening, and he was someone who would have received treatment in the very early kind of developments in plastic surgery or constructive surgery. So he was a fellow who, he came back after his um, injuries to Australia and he had, had to have ongoing sort of operations and treatments because of his injuries. Um, and, um, you know, it's a complicated <coughs> story, um, this one. He, so he came back and he met a woman on a train, as you do, and she sort of talked about that her husband had been injured in the war and you know, similar kind of injuries and that kind of thing, and they developed a rapport, and within months they were married. Unbeknownst to him, she was already married to another Australian who um, was still in the UK um, waiting to be repatriated. And she was from the UK, this woman, um, and she couldn't wait for her husband, so she hooked up with another man who impersonated her husband so that she could come to Australia. And she, um, anyway, befriended Collins and they got married. And it wasn't until her first husband turned up in Sydney and turned up at their house that he found out that his wife was actually married, so she was a bigamist. So she was um, tried for bigamy at Darlinghurst Court, and the newspaper reports at the time talk about how both husbands chatted amicably in the courtroom. Um, that's quite sort of interesting. And then anyway, and she, um, the, the story goes, he became increasingly um, like mood swings. Um, she decided, you know, she wanted to move on, she wanted to leave, um, and he saw her one night sort of flirting with other men and, you know, street in uh, Woolloomooloo, and he approached her and he shot her um, very close range. She stumbled into a fruit shop, um, and suddenly he realised what he'd done. He was overcome with remorse. He hailed a cab, got her taken to Sydney Hospital, admitted that he'd done this, um, you know, didn't know what came over him kind of thing, and he was charged with her murder. Um, now, here's an interesting one because in his trial, different specialists were brought in to talk about the kind of injuries he, uh, he had. And if um, a specialist spoke about um, the, what today we might call post traumatic stress disorder, so it suggests something like that, um, and that he um, perhaps didn't have the ability to um, moderate his emotions. Um, so there was that kind of thinking based around um, what sort of brain injuries or trauma he might have had. Um, and so, again, the jury um, sort of had had some decision-making and they actually found him guilty of manslaughter. And he got quite a light sentence. Um, he only did three years and he did it like a, what we call today a low-security prison. 
and then he was released, and he went on to um, marry again and, and live a long life, and died in the 1950s. So he was again one that you know it starts to connect the the war, and um, you know that kind of unusual. I just want to show you these ones from. So we've got 1930s, that's very late in a set of records. Uh, we've got 1929, and what you see with these two, uh, so Amy Lee and Dorothy Mort, Dorothy Mort is quite a well-known one. She was a, she was from the North Shore, wife of a doctor. Um, and she murdered her lover, and she was found not guilty on the grounds of insanity. Amy Lee, on the other hand, offensive behaviour, cocaine possession, loitering, attempted stealing, prostitution, that kind of thing. So you get two sort of different social classes here, and you can read a lot from the image. You can read a lot from the demeanour of the person. Um, you can read a lot. I mean, she's obviously she's got nice shoes. She's well dressed, but then there's this kind of weird thing happening. Like what's going on there? Um, Amy Lee moving around, her head's out of focus. You know, she looks like she's been on the street, and she has been on the street. So Dorothy Mort was someone who was often used as a um, a way. So she was from the upper middle class, and sometimes it was thought that she actually hadn't been held to account properly for the murder that she committed, that she'd been treated too leniently, and that others like Amy Lee, would, because they were from sort of the less desirable classes, were actually treated more harshly in the criminal justice system. So that's just an interesting one in terms of looking at social class and what these images represent. I won't go into Napoleon, this one's a story, but here we have a gentleman, a successful gentleman who was convicted of murder. And as I said before, quite often the image was taken as soon as they entered the prison. So in his case, he was tried at Darlinghurst Jail, taken through the tunnel into Darlinghurst Prison, and his image taken, and he's still in his finery. Okay, William Deacon. I'm hoping I can um, play this file for you and then I will finish up. William Deacon was a boy and he was convicted of murder. William Deacon uh, uh, commissioned a writer to create, recreate his story. William Deacon was a boy convicted of murder, sentenced to death, commuted to life. And you should enjoy this. So we've reimagined his story. My name is William Deacon. I'm here in this cell by myself, all the time, alone. And the guards keep the leg irons on me. That's the rule, they reckon. The metal bites into my ankles and the chain between my feet drags on the stone floor with each step. Not that you can walk far in this mean and tiny space. 23 hours out of every day on my own in this cell. No visitors. My father and brothers are in Victoria, most likely. That's too far to come. Especially since I was hauled all the way up here to Broken Hill Jail. And maybe no one would visit me anyway. So, the only people I see are the guards and the chaplain. Some days, I'll crack myself up real angry, steaming mad. Other times, I'm as miserable and wretched as a bandicoot. One hour out of every day, I get taken to exercise the yard, but it's not much bigger than a horse stall. I'm all alone then, too. There are no other blokes shuffling about in that yard. The chaplain reckons the other prisoners are bad men who would infect my character with their depraved ways. I wouldn't care. I'd just be glad to see another living soul walking, breathing, looking at my face as I look at their face. A person needs that, or they go crap brained. Crazy is alone. The chaplain says I'm here alone, so I do what they call sorrowful and solitary repentance. So as I'll think about what I did and feel bad. I do feel bad about what I did. Me and my little brother Joe went across the river into New South Wales to do some fishing. Our dog was with us, a white terrier with black spots. We brought a gun to go rabbiting too. We ran into this bloke camped on the riverbank. Toulon was his name, found out later. We'd already shot a rabbit and he let us cook it on his campfire using his gridiron. But then later the bloke got huffy because we were messing around with his stuff. Just being silly kids. 
We weren't going to steal anything, but he made it out like we were. The fellow got so cranky, he said he put the police on us. We slunk off, but I couldn't get it out of my head. That mongrel was going to put the police on us. I couldn't have that. Me and Joe had already been state wards, and I ran away from the industrial school more than once. They treat you rough in those places. Never give you enough food and quick to give any kid a bashing. Some of the snakes who work there, you never know when they'll shove you in some corner, take off their belt and whack you with it so hard, the buckle tears pieces out of your skin all over. They can do worse, but sometimes worse. Anyway, believe me when I say it's harsh in them boys' homes. The fear of going back there, you know, it spooks me. Turn my guts around. Or not up with the worry of that. So I couldn't let that bloke get us locked up. That's how come I went back to the riverbank where he was sleeping. There were too many bad notions hissing inside my head to stop and think clear. Times like that, a person can do something stupid. But this time, this time, the stupid thing I'd done was, well, I shot him in the head. That man too long. I know it was wrong. And foolish too, because on account of me not wanting to get locked up, now I'm in this place, locked up tight. No running away from here. My brother gave evidence against me in the court. I don't blame him. He's only a little tacker. And I did what he said I did. I stood there in the dock and the judge said I was condemned to death. Condemned to death. The words go through your body like caustic soda, burning till your insides are soup. Foul-smelling soup. Some days, sitting here knowing I'm a goner, I think, these are the last hours of your life, Willie. you got to make every hour count. Even in this stinking place. If I'm in the yard and there's the tiniest scrap of sun, I put my face to it and soak it in. Some nights... Alone in this dark cell, hour after hour. It's like I'm already dead. Once they hang me, maybe being dead won't be so different. But when I imagine the rope scraping around my neck, fear prickles along my skin and my heart beats hard against my ribs. I can feel warm blood pulsing through my chest and I know I'm alive. I don't want to die. I don't. Sometimes I have a bit of a cry, like a little kid. No one sees on account of me being in this place with deep walls and no person in Kuwait to hear me blubber and sob like a stupid rat. Then this morning, this very morning, the guard came here and he reckoned they won't be hanging me. Instead, they're going to keep me locked up for 15 years. I've had some schooling, but I can do sums. I'm 15 years old now, so I'll be about 30 when they let me out. 15 years in prison. It's got to be better than being dead. So there he is, uh, that image of him 15 years later. So that's an imaginative, uh, a creative um, telling of his story. So we have the, the factual <coughs> information that we've been able to gather from the records and then um, commissioning an imaginative or creative response to that. But that's uh, some of the really interesting and wonderful work you can do with these kinds of records. Um, and there's just one more image I want to show you. You might remember Arthur Astle. The angelic looking boy who um, is done for murder, for having um, supposedly killed the farmer's wife. That's his grandson. <laughs>
So we had the exhibition at Kingswood, and when um, the exhibition was being installed, a member of the public who comes to use um, the records every now and again, she walked upstairs, the first thing she saw was Aunt Astral, and she said, um, my son's married uh, to his great granddaughter. So she put us in touch with Frank Astral, and he came and um, saw the exhibition. So again, you know, wonderful um, material in terms of connecting uh, people and families over time. And to me, it's just, that's a great photo in itself because the um, uh, similarity between the two is really incredible. Uh, and he knew about his grandfather's story. He remembers his grandfather. He remembers him riding a bike, smoking cigarettes, that kind of thing. A very wiry, wiry kind of um, active, active guy. So that's just an example of um, some of the work that me and um, my colleagues at State Archives have done. Just also to let you know that while I talk about having nine months to turn an exhibition around, there's a whole lot of work that happened before that, and that was things like, um, you know, some years ago, volunteers coming and repairing um, glass plate negatives. There's things like um, the process involved in digitising 46,000 pages of paper records. So all of this kind of front-end work um, needed to be happened before the, the material um, was available to then um, engage with uh, through the <coughs> So, uh, are there any questions? I'm just mindful of the time. Uh -huh. um.